This is the seventh in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of man. We're looking now at his destiny and what the Bible has to say about hell, eternal hell. And the nature and characteristics of hell, we said that hell is a place of unquenchable fire. It's a place of memory and remorse. It's a place of thirst, a place of misery and pain, of frustration and anger. Hell is a place of separation. And one of the saddest things about hell is hell is a place originally prepared for Satan and his hosts. I think that's the saddest thing about hell, is that unsaved man goes there, so to speak, as an uninvited guest. Remember, Jesus brings us out in Matthew 25, verse 41. Uh, Jesus said, Then shall he say also, he's predicting what he himself will say someday, unto them on the left hand, all unsaved, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, you know, you can search the entire Bible, entire 774,747 words, 1,189 chapters and 30 1,173 verses, and you'll find the only prepared place for man is heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. But if man deliberately rejects the prepared place for him, then God has, of course, no other alternative but to send him to the unprepared place, and he does that, and that place is hell. All right, now, the final thing about hell, the characteristics of hell, hell is a place created for all eternity. And I'll admit, of all the things about the doctrine of hell, one of the things, perhaps the thing that I do not understand, and I just have to take this by faith, is that why God would deem it necessary to send a man to hell for all eternity. I mean, we have the, of course, philosophy on earth, let the punishment fit the crime. And if a man does a certain thing, then he's fined. If he does something else, perhaps he's actually put in prison. If he does something else, he's executed. Uh, but uh, here, uh, here we have all men unsaved, all unsaved women, and fellows and gals also, teenagers, uh, spending eternity in hell. And the only thing we can say in regards to that is that when man sins against God, he sins against the infinite creator of the universe. And that sin then demands an eternal retribution. Now, he can, if he desires, he can, of course, repent and ask Jesus to save him because Jesus suffered the eternality of hell on the cross. But if he doesn't, if he refuses the only gift to keep him from hell, then he must pay the price, and that price will take him all through eternity. Uh, you know, we uh, love to sing that song, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Uh, but really, to paraphrase this a little, uh, we could say when they've been there, unsaved people, when they've been there 10,000 years, fire hotter than the sun, they've no less days to curse and rave than when they first begun. And you stop to think about this, that, that uh, Jesus Christ doubtless saw men. The Bible says he saw them as a shepherd, as sheep having no shepherd, and he had compassion on them, but he saw them more than just uh, sheep. He saw them, men and women, carrying around in their bosoms immortal, eternal souls that would live forever and ever, either in heaven or hell. And that was the thing that drove him on. And during those last days, the Bible says he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. And there he prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
All right, now, so much concerning the characteristics of hell. Now, what about the occupants of hell? Who will someday be confined to Gehenna, permanent hell forever? Well, of course, Satan will be there. Uh, Romans 16, verse 20, uh, Paul says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And then in Revelation 20, verse 10, John says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Often people ridicule the devil, and he's sort of an impish creature, and they have him dressed in a long flannel pair of red underwear, and he has two horns and a tail, and he's pitching coal in the furnaces of hell. Well, obviously he's not there now. He has right now access to the very right hand of God. And, uh, but someday Satan will be cast in, not with his long flannel pair of red underwear, but he'll be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. So Satan will be in hell. And then the Antichrist will be there. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul says, And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And then the false prophet, the sidekick of the Antichrist, will be there. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, that's the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. This, of course, will happen during the tribulation. With which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both, the Antichrist now and the false prophet, were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the first two criminals to be cast into eternal hell uh, are the Antichrist, will be the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we can think of no more deserving characters than these two. All right, now, so Satan will be there and the Antichrist will be there, the false prophet, and then all fallen angels. In 2 Peter 2, verse 4, uh, Peter says, If God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Uh, the word hell here in 2 Peter is translated Tartarus, and in the Greek New Testament it's only found here in the Greek uh, entire Greek New Testament, and uh, some think it is possible that the word Tartarus is a special place in Gehenna hell. But regardless of the word is, uh, Satan and all the fallen angels will be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, we don't know how many fallen angels there are. Uh, there may be many, many millions or even billions. The fact of the matter is, um, in Mark chapter 5, we're told that the the devil could afford to waste some 6,000 demons and fallen angels in the body of one poor bum. Remember, he was a, a fellow, that the maniac of Gadara. And Jesus carried on a conversation with him and asked him, the demons, uh, who the fellow was there in, in charge. And, the, and the, one of the evil spirits says, uh, my name is Legion. I'm the spokesman here. And, and uh, I'm called Legion because we were many. We are many. Well, in the... In the, in the Roman army, a legion uh, consisted of 6,000 troops. And so uh, we, may, uh, we may assume from this verse here that, that there were 6,000 demons possessing this man. Now, Satan could waste that many on just one poor, unimportant, uh, insane man. How many does he really have? He may have billions and billions, and all unsaved, all fallen angels uh, will be there also. And then uh, you have in your notes uh, the next one here, Judas Iscariot. And he's the betrayer of Christ, and he's singled out here in particular because uh, there are those, notably one of my teachers at the Moody Bible Institute, Dr. Kenneth Weiss, who believes that Judas will be consigned to a special place in Gehenna on the basis of Peter's words concerning Judas in the upper room just prior to Pentecost. Remember, Judas brought this out. He said, uh, fellows, we have to uh, choose a new apostle here to take the place of Judas because he's fallen. 
And this new apostle, he said, will take the place, Acts 1, verse 25, of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And in the Greek, that's to his own particular place, his unique place. And so we felt that that was a special place in hell just for Judas. And then, of course, in answering the question, who will be in hell, all unsaved people, all unsaved people will be in hell. In Revelation 21 and verse 8, uh, John the Apostle lists these that will be in hell. He said, but the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now let's uh, describe and uh, consider some of these categories. Let's examine them. Uh, this uh, eight, the list of eight here. Number one, it says the fearful. Now you know at first glance, uh, this might seem strange to find the fearful at the top of this divine uh, rogues gallery of Gehenna. Uh, really, that doesn't seem to be so bad, does it? I can understand why the abominable will be there and the murderers and the whoremongers and the fornicators and sorcerers and liars, but why the fearful? What's so bad about being fearful? Uh, well, no doubt about it, the fear of man, according to Proverbs 29, verse 25, bringeth a snare, and uh, I think probably the fear of man has put more people in hell than uh, fornicating and sorcery and worshiping idols, etc. Uh, in our study of the life of Christ, we came to John chapter 9, and you remember that's when the time when Jesus did one of his great miracles. He healed a man that was born blind. It's a wonderful miracle, but I think it's one of the sad miracles. There's a sad note attached to it because... Uh, Remember, the Pharisees couldn't believe that Jesus healed this man who was born blind. And so what they did, they, uh, they went to his parents and they asked the question. They said, hey, you got some fella running around here. He's a Bible banger and he's jumping up and down and, and saying glory and everything. And he claims, number one, that he was born blind. And secondly, obviously, he can see now. And then he claims he was your son. Now, we'd like to know, what do you think about this? And and uh, so uh, his parents said, well, we'll answer your questions. Number one, he was born blind, no doubt about that. Secondly, he is our son, that's true. But thirdly, your question, how do you think uh, he received his sight? We cannot say. Uh, he is of age, ask him. Well, they knew why he could see. Doubtless, as soon as he was able to see, he ran home and told them that a man called Jesus had healed him. But the Bible says, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. So that, uh, that ex-blind man has been in heaven with Jesus for some 2,000 years, but I think it's sad to contemplate that his parents are probably in hell because they are part of the fearful here. And then in John 12, we have a similar passage. Uh, verses 42 and 43, Nevertheless, we read, Among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, you know, some of the chief rulers, they just didn't acknowledge Christ as being the Son of God at all. And they said, no, he's an imposter and we don't believe in him. But there were a number that said, well, frankly, off the record, don't print what I say now, but off the record, uh, we have come to the conclusion that this Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of God, and what he says is true. But we're not going to accept him. Well, why not? Well, because uh, we have uh, heard, of course, and we're aware of the fact that if we do this, confessing publicly, we'll be put out of the synagogue, and frankly, that's too much a price to pay. We're afraid of what men might do to us. That's why the fearful, I think, is at number one in the list here. The fearful. And then number two, it speaks of the abominable. And literally, it means those defiled with abominations. Um, when I think of this second 
category here, the fearful. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over one. I should take that now. The fearful and then the unbelieving. That's the second of the eight categories, and I'll talk about that for a minute. This is literally the disbelieving. Now, no man ever goes to hell because he can't believe, but bad, rather because he won't believe. There's no such thing as an honest agnostic. And uh, so the unbelieving, the disbelieving, they'll be in hell along with the fearful. So you have the fearful, the unbelieving, and then the abominable. And as I started to say a minute ago, when I think of the abominable, I think of, uh, well, excuse the expression, I think of that perverted group that had broken up now, but used to be number one in the entire world as far as music is concerned in some areas, the Beatles. And they said that filthy groups said more bad things about Jesus and about Christianity and about good and righteous and holy concepts than I think uh, uh, anybody, even the younger generation, would dare imagine. It's not normally well known, but one of the fellows, John Lennon, I think by name, of the Beatles, uh, wrote a book. Thank God it wasn't a very bestseller, uh, but it was called The Spaniard. And this book was sort of a, oh, uh, what's the word I want? I uh, can't think of it now, but uh, it was a, a, a book that uh, depicted in a certain form the, the life of Jesus. And it was a book referring to Jesus himself. And in this book, uh, one of the Beatles then described Jesus as a bow-legged, garlic-eating Spanish bastard a bow-legged, garlic-eating, Spanish bastard. And someday I can see uh, the Beatles standing before the great white judgment throne, unless they repent, and there seems to be no evidence that they will repent, uh, and they'll be crying for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them and hide them from the face of the Lamb, and they will be jumping up and down and singing, I want to hold your hand, and some of the other garbage that they sang here on earth. Uh, the Beatles along with the abominable. So you have the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and then the murderers. And, uh, of course, the murderers here uh, does not mean that a person who murders someone cannot be saved, because they can, obviously. Uh, but what it does mean here is those murderers that do not repent, uh, they'll be in hell forever. And then the fornicators, uh, those that are given over to sexual matters, and we see so much of that today. This is literally, they call it the age of Aquarius, it's really the age of sexual perversion. The fornicators and sorcerers, uh, those that, and the word sorcerers here is a reference to not only devil worships, uh, worshipers, but those who uh, traffic in the drug market. And really, this sorcery thing has just come into being in the last 15 or 20 years. A few years ago, no one but a scientist or a doctor would know what LSD and marijuana and, and uh, some of these other drugs uh, wouldn't even know what they were. Uh, but, of course, all that's changed today. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, uh, those who worship something or someone else apart from God, and this idolatry uh, worship is not limited to Africa where men bow down to some totem pole and uh, worship the witch doctor. You see a lot of idolaters in America that think more of a ball game or of a new car or of a banking account uh, or of um, a Hollywood contract or whatever than they do of, of the God who made them. The idolaters and all liars... I think it's sobering to contemplate uh, that the uh, passage here, which speaks of uh, liars, it's connected to John 8 and 1 John 2, and these speak of religious liars. John 8, 44, uh, Jesus says, Ye are to the Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your fathers ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And then First John 2.22, Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, 
that denieth the Father and the Son. So actually, this uh, is a reference here to spiritual liars. We've all lied, I suppose, in our life. And, of course, unsaved liars still go to hell. But, but basically, it's not someone just telling uh, something that uh, distorting a fact. But this is a religious liar, someone who pretends that he is true to the word of God and yet who lies about it. Uh, I can list some liars uh, that will be in hell, as far as we know, that did not repent. Uh, religious liars, J. Preston Bradley, for example, who is, uh, I guess he's still living, I don't know. Uh, he was pastor of the People's Church in Chicago. And I heard him say on one, that's a good name for it, it's a very popular church. It is the People's Church and not the Lord's Church. But I heard him say on radio once to a group of uh, new church members, he said, now, uh, we have about 150 that have come in membership this year. And he said, you're all gathered here today, and I'm preaching a sermon to you. He said, uh, we have not asked you what you believe about anything. He said, frankly, we do not care what you believe. It is not important what you believe. It is how you conduct your life. Well, that's a lie. And uh, he's a religious man, and that makes him a religious liar. Uh, men like uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick. Uh, Baptist preacher who died some years back, uh, who uh, once said that he did not believe in the second coming of Christ, nor did he know of any intelligent Christian who did. Well, that's a lie. And he was a religious man that made him a liar. And then the late Bishop Pike, who ridiculed until the last few months of his death the very idea of a heaven or hell, and uh, yet who went to Jerusalem and who died in the Judean desert. And then Eugene, Eugene Carlson Blake, who was at one time head of the World Council of Churches. And then you have religious liars who form the cults, men like Charles Taze Russell, the head of Jehovah Witnesses, a liar in hell. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Christian Science Religion, a liar. Herbert W. Armstrong and Garner Ted Armstrong, religious liars. Sung Moon, uh, the present uh, Korean false messiah. And then Joe Smith, who's the founder of the Mormon Church, all religious liars. And obviously they'll be there along with the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, the murders, etc. All right, now we've looked thus far in our description of hell. We've tried, or our discussion of hell. We've tried to, uh, first of all, uh, see who will be there and then the characteristics of it, etc., and the location. Now, the final aspect, the present possible existence of hell today. Where will hell be? Well, we know that final hell is a place of outer darkness. As we said, it will not be in the heart of the earth, as Gehenna hell is a place removed from the earth. The earth, by the way, will be completely renovated and, and burned with a fervent heat, and this will take place after the millennium in uh, 2 Peter 2 or 2 Peter 3. It says actually that the rocks themselves will melt with a fervent heat and the earth will be destroyed and be recreated. And there will be no bad thing recreated with it, so hell will be far removed from the earth. But uh, is it possible that, uh, that hell has already been prepared? Now we know heaven, and I'll talk about that later, is still being prepared because Jesus said 2,000 years ago, one of the reasons he had to leave, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. But what about uh, hell? Is hell already prepared? Now, there are several scripture, scriptural, and I think maybe one scientific to indication that would uh, suggest that Gehenna hell is right now in existence. It's ready for its occupants. Uh, in his book... Things to Come, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, a Greek scholar and theologian at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, writes the following words. Uh, he says, and he quotes Matthew 25, verse 41, uh, where Jesus said, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, this is unsaved people, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Dr. Pentecost goes on to say, the word prepared here in Matthew 25 is literally, in the Greek, having been prepared, suggesting that the lake of fire is already in existence 
and awaiting its occupants. He goes on to say, it is the, th it is the thesis of C.T. Swartz, then of New York University, that such a place as a lake of fire is known to science today. And I won't read all this, you can read it yourself, but Dr. Pentecost uh, quotes Swartz, who is a physicist, in suggesting that the uh, lake of fire may actually be connected with some heavenly stars. And he suggests here the, the midget stars or the white dwarf stars. Uh, but uh, I'll quote his final statement here and then uh, quote one that give you an idea of what I think. He says, may I summarize to show that the Bible, God's word, is scientifically accurate. We find first, as we examine these midget stars now that are known to the astronomers, an eternal fire which cannot burn out. There consist, that consists the midget stars. Being of liquid consistency, it is, secondly, a lake of fire. So these midget stars, apparently any fire would be in the form of a lake there, liquid. In the third place, it cannot be quenched. For any quenching material, such as water, would immediately have its atoms stripped of electrons and be packed in with the rest. In the fourth place, Pentecost goes on to say, since astronomers have been and still are studying this strange phenomena, it is only too evident that the lake of fire has been prepared and is now ready. Although we cannot say that God will actually use these lakes of fire in fulfilling his word, the answer to the skeptics is in the heavens where there are lakes of fire. And then as a final note, you can see in your uh, book here that I have added a paragraph which appears under the scientific section of the 1972 Family Almanac concerning a very strange phenomena called the black holes. And by the way, I would suggest that you uh, go back now to your notes on the Old Testament. Uh, I don't have my book with me, but it's basic stages in the book of ages and uh, look at the big textbook, the color textbook, and look at the first few pages where I describe uh, the black hole phenomena in much more detail than I do on your notes here on the doctrine of man. But uh, certainly, uh, what I'm saying is that if one compares what Jesus says about hell with eternal hell with what some scientists like Dr. Kip Thorne of the California uh, Institute of Technology and some of the rest of the scientists who are certainly not Christians but astronomers and if uh, you compare what they say about these black holes with what Jesus says about hell and you almost get the idea that they're describing the same thing. Well, I suppose the bottom line summary of hell is this, that Jesus died to keep men from going there. I think we have a few minutes left here. I'm looking down at my faithful tape uh, maker down here, and he tells me that I've got about how many minutes left, Herbie? I've got about 10 minutes. All right, and this is the seventh lecture. So I want to take these final 10 minutes and just simply introduce the final tape or the final lecture, which is, of course, in our study of the doctrine of man, his destiny, what the Bible says about heaven. Last May, as I, actually the last few Mays, I should say, but last May, I'm speaking here in 1977 now, uh, we graduated some 95 students from the Thomas Road Bible Institute here in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, we have a little ceremony that we go through right before we uh, mount the stage and receive the diplomas from Jerry, the pastor. Uh, we get the institutes to get institute students together and, and we have prayer and we stand and sing, God be with you till we meet again and blessed assurance and and uh, songs like that, and then we uh, join hands, and I give them a little uh, final summary, and I say, now, students, in the last two years, uh, we uh, at the Institute, the teachers and the pastor and myself, we've attempted to the very best of our ability to tell you everything we know about the Bible in two years, everything we know about Jesus and about salvation, 
and about heaven and about hell. Now you're going to graduate in a few minutes and go out and be confronted by a world that's on its way to a Christless hell without hope in this present world. And we insist that as graduates of the Thomas Road Bible Institute that you go out and give them heaven. And for the next few minutes, on the last few minutes on this tape, and then the final lecture, I'd like to, to give you heaven. Because I tell you what, we get too much of the other, don't we? And that's what God wants all saved people do, to go out and give unsaved people a little taste of heaven. I think uh, far too often uh, we get our theology about heaven from Walt Disney and not from the Word of God. Uh, he heaven is certainly not a, a place where a group of disembodied spirits sit around, sit around with halos and harps on clouds uh, discussing how much fun they had on earth. Uh, actually, we know quite a bit more about heaven uh, than we do about hell. Uh, in your notes, you'll have several quotations, of course, from Dr. Wilbert Smith in his book, The Biblical Doctrine of Heaven. And here he lists two significant quotes, one from a world-famous theologian who should have known better, and one from a scientist about heaven. Uh, the theologian, who I believe is dead now, Dr. Reinald Niebuhr, who taught in one of our most uh, influential seminaries for many years, uh, probably was the most influential theologian in America. And he says, a theologian now, speaking about heaven, he says, it is unwise for Christians to claim any knowledge of either the furniture of heaven or the temperature of hell. Well, neighbor apparently never read the word of God. There's a lot about the furniture of heaven and the temperature of hell. And uh, Dr. Alfred Whitehead said this about hell and about heaven. I'm sure, as a scientist, he has, he's uh, gone out into eternity now, and I'm sure he regrets saying this. He says, as for the Christian theology, can you imagine anything more appallingly idiotic than the Christian idea of heaven? Well, yes, I can, Dr. Whitehead. I can imagine a statement that you made as being more idiotic uh, than the doctrine of heaven. I remember some time ago, by the way, hearing a, a theologian uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and he was a liberal, and he made this statement. He said, well, he said, some of you have asked me what I think about heaven and hell. He said, I no longer, as, as a boy I did, but he said, I no longer believe in the existence of heaven and hell after you die. He said, uh, and I don't uh, like to talk about a red-hot hell or a sky-high heaven. He said, actually, I do believe heaven and hell exists, but I believe they exist on earth. And he went on to give the illustration. You get up one morning and everything is bad and you're late for work and you about lose your job and, and you're not feeling well and you don't get that raise. Well, that's, that's, that's a kind of hell. That's a type of hell. But a few weeks later, why, you finally do get the rage and you feel a lot better and your wife's speaking to you and, and uh, well, that's, that's, that's a, a type of heaven. Now, you know, in a sense, he was right, as liberal as he was, as, as uh, erroneous as he might have been in other areas, that theologian was right to this extent. This world is the only heaven the unsaved person will ever know. There's an ad on television, I think I brought this to your attention before, and it's a wicked ad, and I don't like it, but it is as true as John 3.16. It's about a beer, and it says this, uh, you only go around one time, and you've got to grab all the gusto you can get. Now, that's true, you know. If I were unsaved, going to remain unsaved, I'd really live it up, and I'd grab all the gusto I could get, and I'd do everything that if it felt good, I'd do it, because you see... This world is the only heaven that the unsaved person will ever know. And he better live it up down here because he's not going to have any other chance out there. But by the same token, the other side of the coin, and this is thrilling, this world is the only hell that the believer will ever know. Now, there are those listening to my voice. I know, and the thousands of students taking this course, I know beyond the shadow of doubt that are literally going through hell. I mean, some of you have incurable diseases. Uh, some of you are going to find out in the near future if you've not found out already. 
if our uh, statistics are correct, that you have cancer. One out of every four now uh, gets this dreaded disease, and, and that's going to be a taste of hell. Or you're going to have family problems. Or I'm talking to a pastor. We have nearly a thousand pastors enrolled in this course, and perhaps you're having problems with the deacons, and, and you think those deacons are really demons. And uh, you may uh, be suffering from job pressure, from a hundred other things that can just drive you up the wall. Now, let me just say rejoice and be exceedingly glad because you see the devil has to get to you down here because he can't touch you out there. Uh, again, I'll make that statement. This world is the only heaven the unsaved person will ever know, but it's the only hell that the saved person will ever know. All right, now... What do we know about heaven? And by the way, there is more information in the Bible about heaven than there is about hell. Now, I know sometimes uh, flaming evangelists run around saying that Jesus spoke far more about hell than he did about heaven. Don't you believe it? Uh, he actually gave it about equal treatment, even Stephen. Uh, for every one statement he made about heaven, he made another one about hell in the gospel account. But if you take the entire Bible, and I've had the privilege of reading the Bible through perhaps two to three to maybe even four hundred times. I've lost track, but I read it through quite a bit, teach it, uh, meditate upon it day and night practically. And uh, I can guarantee you the Bible has far more from Genesis to Revelation to say about heaven than it does about hell. And of course that's only logical, it's natural. We would expect God to brag about heaven, to promote heaven, now, he's going to warn people about hell, but he wants people to go to heaven, so he's going to tell us more about it. All right, now, uh, what do we know about heaven? Well, uh, let me talk just a moment, and that's about all we have left, about the capital of heaven. Now, actually, in the Bible, and we've discussed this in other tapes, we read about three heavens. Uh, the first heaven, and that's the home of the birds and the clouds, and the second heaven, that's the home of the sun, moon, and stars. And then the third heaven, the abode of God. And, of course, this is the heaven we want to talk about now, the abode of God. And by the way, I'm making these tapes in 1977. It's less than 10 years to this date, that uh, from this date, that man succeeded in leaving the first heaven and going to the second heaven. Remember in 1968. Uh, three astronauts uh, left the first heaven, the atmospheric heaven, and climbed uh, 240,000 miles into outer space and circled the moon. They made their way to the second heaven, and that's the home of the sun, moon, and stars. And then they came back to earth again. But I'd like to say if Jesus tarries a million years, and I'm sure he's not going to, but if he does, no scientist or inventor will ever be able to conjure up a spacecraft that will take sinful mankind into the third heaven. Because Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the third heaven, let alone get into it. So we're talking now about the third heaven. Now in a sense, uh, heaven may be regarded as a country. Um, Hebrews uh, 11, the apostle Paul describes some of the uh, patriarchs in the Old Testament, he talks about them in the New Testament, and he says that uh, they suffered uh, much pain because they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. So in a sense, a general sense, heaven may be thought of as a country. Well, of course, every country has a capital, and every capital has a name. And so uh, heaven has a capital, and it has a name. It's in the form of a city. And both Old and New Testament believers looked for and longed for this celestial city. Because you see, the Bible teaches that within this heavenly country there abides a dazzling, high, and holy city. And this blessed city is not, therefore, not only the center of God's presence, but this city will be the permanent home for all the redeemed throughout eternity. As I say, you don't even have to wait till you get to the New Testament to find this city uh, described, because in the Old, or at least anticipated in the Old Testament, a fellow named Abraham, the Bible says, Abraham, who lived 2,000 years before Christ, he looked for a city which hath foundation, 
whose builder and maker is God. And then the Bible says, or David spoke of this, he says, glorious things are spoken of thee, Zion, city of our God. And also David says in Psalm 46, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. He's not talking about the earthly city. David is talking about a heavenly city. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Now, you have this city, unnamed, but you have it at least anticipated in the Old Testament. Now, John 14, Jesus promises to build this city. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, literally many dwelling places. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. So he promises now to build this city. But it is not until you come to Revelation 21, the next to the last chapter in the Bible, you actually have an eyewitness account of this city. The fellow's name is John the Apostle, and here's what he writes, and he gives us the name of this city. And I, John, saw the holy city, and here's the name of it, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So when you think of the capital of America, you think of Washington, D.C., the capital of Japan, you think of Tokyo. When you think of heaven, uh, think of heaven now as a city. And this city is as literal as Washington, D.C. This city is as literal as London, England, and Tokyo, Japan, and Madrid, Spain, and Amman, Jordan, or Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem down here on earth. It's a literal actual city. And in the final tape, we're going to discuss a number of things about this city. We're going to look at the construction of the city, how big it is, and its uh, shape, its size, and who's going to live there, the walls, the gates, the main street, the throne, to say there's far more about heaven in the Bible than there is about hell. Well, I'll tell you what, students, I'm going to close this tape three minutes early, and I don't know about you, but I'm tired, and I'm going to go out and have a cup of coffee, and I want you to do that also. You are dismissed. This completes Lecture 4A of the Doctrine of Man. You may now take your midterm exam. You will find it in the exam packet marked Midterm E1.